Today I'm starting, a, we're starting a series about Israel and about end times and uh, Pastor Jeff will be preaching next week and so, you know, we, we saw the horrible things happening and I would just say that I'm aware that uh, there are so many um, horrible things that have happened. Uh, Hamas is evil. Uh, Hamas uh, in 1987 was founded in Gaza by the Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a Palestinian cleric as an offshoot of the Egyptian-based Muslim Brotherhood. In 1988, Hamas published its charter calling for the destruction of Israel and the establishment of an Islamic state in its place. <clears throat> a part of their covenant reads this way, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it. That's an opening paragraph. The day of judgment, it says in Article 7, would not come until the Muslims fight and kill the Jews. What happened on October 7 is the worst act against, the worst anti-Semitic, the worst act against the Jews since the Holocaust. It's satanic what took place and, uh, and evil. I am aware that when there's war, there's innocent people that lose their lives. We have two schools, one in Palestinian, Palestine in that area of Gaza, one in Bethlehem, and I'm sure some others, Assemblies of God, have reached Palestinians for Jesus. And there are many Palestinian Christians. And a lot of them are suffering and there's a lot of pain. And whether it's Jews, Israel, or the Palestinians, or whoever else it is, there are many people that are pure innocent. But when war starts, and a crime so violent and vile as it took place against Israel on October 7, then I think that we need to just pray, and pray as the Bible teaches us to, for the peace of Israel, and pray that there'll be peace in that place and that innocent people um, don't die. Let me, let me tell you something. There's a war also of, of propaganda and uh, that happens. And none of us live there. Uh, Dr. Nunley, who was in Israel, who's gone, taken us to Israel many times, will be here in two weeks to share with our church. And he's got a perspective like no one else does. He's got many friends that live in the land of Israel that are Palestinians. And there are many of the people that lived in the Gaza Strip that the Israelites would let come through the borders and work in Israel. And um, Israel was giving and helping the Palestinians that were actually, uh, uh, a lot of them kind of held hostage and made the need uh, Hamas who took by force rulership and, uh, and so, uh, but when this happened, uh, I mean, you've read the news, uh, continue to read the news. Be sure you uh, read all the news sources if you're going to have an opinion before you have one. And uh, it, what's happening is just tragic over there. Uh, my heart breaks and, you know, it's, it's easy to say something in a situation like this with so many thoughts and pains and hurts and feelings that someone would misunderstand, and that's not my heart. I think you know my heart. And so in 1991, let me give you a timeline of Hamas. Uh, its military wing um, was established. In 93, Hamas began suicide bombings in Israel just prior to the Oslo Accords, which gave the Palestinian Authority autonomy and limited authority to Gaza and the West Bank. In 1997, Hamas was designated a terrorist organization by the United States and dozens of other countries in response to the group's Iran-supported use of explosive and rockets along with suicide bombings and kidnappings to target Israel. In 2000, uh, deadly intifada, which up means uprising of Palestine, Palestinians against Israel started. And uh, 
in 205, 2005, Israel evacuated all their troops and settlers from the Gaza, from Gaza, and built a security fence around Gaza for their own national security. In 2006, Hamas won a surprise victory in Palestinian parliamentary the elections and then seized full control of Gaza, overthrowing forces loyal to the president and uh, of, of, of the Gaza. As a result, much of, the, much of the international community cut off aid to Gaza because they did not want to finance a terrorist-sponsored territory. And uh, of course, October 7, we know what happened there. 1,500 terrorists enter Israel and attack and slaughter and abduct Jews in the worst mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. The Bible says, and I, what's going on here is satanic. These, these terrorist groups, Hezbollah, uh, whatever the, the groups are, all of them, it, it is a spiritual thing and it's satanic, the attack and the hatred. Anti-Semitism is straight from Satan. Satan hates the Jews because it's where the Messiah came. Satan hates Israel because it's God's chosen. Satan knows what the Bible says and wants to destroy uh, Israel so that there's no Jews left. The Bible can't play out like it's prophesied to play out. But guess what? Time after time, trying to eradicate the Israel, the Jewish people has failed and it will fail again. Scripture says in uh, talking about the devil, Revelation 12, 4, talking about the devil here, it says uh, that the dragon stood. And right before that, it talks about angels falling, a third of the angels falling, becoming demons. And it says, and the dragon, speaking of Satan, stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's talking about Jesus. Satan was a part of Herod the Great trying to kill Jesus in Bethlehem. Satan has tried to kill two groups that God has covenant with from the very beginning. And that's the Jews who God made a covenant with Abraham. And that's Christians who God made a covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, he, and he's been trying to kill and destroy and trying to spin and, and spread hate against both Jews and against Christians. The Bible even gives in Zeph Zephaniah 2, 4 to 7, it tells what's going to happen to Gaza. It's a prophecy. I don't know if this is the final thing that fits this, but it could be. And if it is, then we're really close to the world ending as we know it. It says in verse 4, Zephaniah 2, Gaza and Ashkelon will be abandoned, Ashdod and Ekron torn down. And what sorrow awaits you. And one, one version of the scripture says that Gaza will be destroyed. And what sorrow awaits you, Philistines. And Palestinians are the Philistines. Goliath was a Philistine. And they named, they gave the name Palestine, Palestinians or the Palestine nation. They gave it to insult the Jews, when the Jews lost their land to insult them because of the war. Because you remember, Goliath was a Philistine. And to insult the Jews, they called it Palestinian. Nonetheless, it's, it's, it's sorrow awaits you Philistines, or that's the Palestinians who live along the coast in the land of Canaan. For this judgment is against you too. The Lord will destroy you until not one of you is left. The Philistine coast will become a wilderness pasture, a place of shepherd camps and enclosures for sheep and goats the remnant of the tribe of Judah will pasture there. They will rest at night in the abandoned houses of Ashkelon which is the part of that, the area that the Palestinians lived in, that the Philistines lived in and uh, uh, all along the coast. It's, it's more than the Gaza Strip that was originally where the Philistines were and it says uh, for the Lord their God will visit his people in kindness and restore their prosperity again. And Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, talking about Israel, and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So just a little bit of background in that reference. Uh, but if you turn in your Bible, see Ezekiel 36. Oh, yeah. Let me say it again so the rest of you will be ready. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 36. 
and welcome online. Pray for me because I'm using a manuscript, which I very rarely do. You're going to have to pay attention. There's a lot of history here. And, uh, but pray for me because this is outside my typical comfort zone as I've always studied and, and kind of preached from my heart. But this, this demands some exacting communications. Ezekiel 36 to the end of the book deals primarily with prophetic events. And Ezekiel is writing in mid-6th century, which is the 500s, mid-6th century B.C., and is writing about end times and prophetic events. He writes about some of the things that have yet to be fulfilled, but he's also will read about things that have happened since some of you were born. How many of you were born uh, before uh, 1948? Raise your hand. If you were born in 38, it means you were 10 years old when Israel was declared a nation. It says, uh, and that's one of the things that is prophesied here in Ezekiel. And he's writing this around 2,500 years ago. In order to understand the prophecies that have happened and will happen in the future, it's very important that we understand the unique role that Israel is playing in history and plays in the future fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus Christ, God gave that land to Abram who was, well, we'll get into that in a minute. And, and the Jews were there. And Jesus Christ was born in Israel. Jesus was raised in Israel. Jesus was crucified in Israel. Jesus rose from the dead in Israel. And Jesus Christ will come back and reign and rule for a thousand years in Israel from Jerusalem. Israel is where you want to be aware of when you look at end times. And But we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's our hope. Before the battle of Armageddon happens and before the millennial reign, the 1,000 years reign of Jesus on the earth, we read in Ezekiel 36 and 37 about that rest restoration, the miraculous restoration of Israel as a nation. That's what I want to talk about. Because ever since the Babylonians besieged and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., and, and, and this is the time that Ezekiel is writing about this during this time frame, Ever since 586 B.C., 20, the next 2,500 years, Israel as a nation does not exist. The land and any Jews living in it are dominated by some other power, and Jews are being killed or dispersed around the world. Between 586 B.C. and 1948 A.D., the Jews had no co common homeland, no government, and not even a common language. Because when the Jews were taken captivity by the, captive by the Babylonians, they would adopt the Aramaic language of their Babylonian captives. They spoke Aramaic. Another major prophecy fulfilled is the way the Jews started accepting and beginning to teach their children and come back to the Hebrew language that they, and they spoke and they taught it to their children when people began to come back to their homeland. The fact that in Israel they speak Hebrew today is a miracle. But the Jews didn't even have a common language. But for 2,500 years, the Jews were dispersed and hated and killed. And they had no homeland, no government, no common language. For 2,500 years, the Jews would be dispersed all over the world, massacred all over the world, thus speaking different languages, living all over the world, which when Israel became a nation, one of the most, most uh, common languages, because there are so many Jews in Germany, was German. But they, all kinds of languages, Jews are all over the world. And, and, and those who lived on the land that was ancient Israel would be dominated and ruled by other rulers and empires. Here are the empires that ruled the land of Israel, that God gave Israel. Babylonian, the, the, the Jews, Babylonian Empire, Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, Arab Islamic Empire, the Catholic Crusaders, and then the Mamelukes, the Ottoman Empire, and the British Empire. Only recently, relatively recent, has the course of the past 25 years radically and miraculously changed for Israel and the Jewish people. And it's a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and 37. This is the reestablishment of the state of Israel, which happened May of 1948. This is what Ezekiel prophesied in the 6th century B.C. that we read today. And this has come to pass, as I mentioned, for anyone here born before 1948. 
And you cannot understand, I want to say it again, you cannot understand end time prophecy unless you understand the unique role of Israel throughout history and today. So I pray, God, that you give us ears to hear and hearts to be open, Jesus, that we would examine our hearts, that we would be ready for you, God, that we would have your heart, Lord, that we would pray for all the innocents, we would love them, we would understand that war is horrible. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would intervene. I pray, God, you would help us to pray and, uh, and just trust you, God, you're sovereign. We believe you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 1, we're going to read the first seven verses in the New Living Translation. The, the other translations say the same thing. This says it very easy to understand. Son of man, prophesy to Israel's mountains. Give them this message, O mountains of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Your enemies have taunted you, saying, Aha, now the ancient heights belong to us. Therefore, son of man, give the mountains of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord. Your enemies have attacked you from all directions, making you the property of many nations and the object of much mocking and slander. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. He speaks to the hills and the mountains, ravines and valleys, and to ruined waste and long deserted cities that have been destroyed and mocked by the surrounding nations. This is what the Lord says. My jealous anger burns against these nations, especially Eden, because they have shown utter contempt for me by gleefully taking my land for themselves as plunder. Therefore, prophesy to the hills and the mountains, the ravines and valleys of Israel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am furious that they have suffered shame before the surrounding nations. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I have taken a solemn oath that those nations will soon have their own shame to endure. The first thing I want you to see is God denounces the, the nations that overtake the land of Israel. The Jewish people are the only people, his chosen people, that have been given a title deed of certain piece of real estate. The land was given to the Jews by God. God brought the Jewish nation into existence out of nothing. There were no Jews. There was not a place called Israel. God sovereignly decided to choose a Gentile by the name of Abram from the Chaldeans that would be the source of the Jewish people that had not existed. God chose Abram, who was a heathen worshiping false gods, to bring about the Jewish race and the nation of Israel, which did not yet exist. Abram, who was living in the land of the Chaldeans, which is ancient Mesopotamia, which means the land between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Abram is hanging out in Iraq. And God appears to Abram in Iraq and makes a covenant with him that out of his seed, God would establish a nation that was chosen by God and a people that was chosen by God. So this race chosen by God, this people chosen by God could produce his chosen people and bring forth a son by the name of Jesus, who is the savior of all nations and all people, all tribes, all tongues, open to all people to call on the name of Jesus. Notice God chose a man and a woman way past their prime of childbearing years. Their bodies were not biologically able to have children. God did this so that everyone knew that it was for God's glory that he was establishing a miracle people and giving them land for a great people and a great nation. God was establishing this nation and people for his own glory. God birthed the people through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God gave them land. And this is the only time God has ever given any deed to land that was declared theirs and would punish anyone who took it from them. God wanted everyone to know that he was the one giving his chosen people, this nation and this land. Do you believe that God gave real estate to the Jewish nation Israel? Because a lot of people around the world don't believe that and don't even respect that. But the Bible says in Genesis 15, 18, so the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. So we'll see a map here. The area shaded in white is between the Nile River of Egypt and the Euphrates River. 
in Iraq is what God gave the title deed to Abraham. And this is the minimum amount, roughly 300,000 square feet. The minimum, some people believe that, some scholars believe that Saudi Arabia was part of the land that God gave Israel. And, uh, but Israel never really realized much of the land to occupy during the kings until King David occupied the largest amount of the land. And you'll see the next slide, and you'll see the purple here. This is under the king, King David, the rule of him. And, and uh, it, uh, 586 B.C. happens, and Jews are dispersed, Jews killed, the first temple's destroyed, and the result is the Babylonian exile. And those who remain in this land now are under the authority of the Babylonian Empire. A little bit of land that some of the Jews lived on and occupied and governed by foreign empires until 1917. World War I in, ended. Great Britain defeated the Ottoman Empire that was ruling over the land that is before you here. The Ottoman Turks were allies of Nazi Germany. And... In 1917, Britain took back this territory in the purple, and they declared, the purple part is the part that they, they took back all of it, and they declared the purple part with the Balfour Declaration in 1917, and gave this part of the land to the homeland for the Jewish people, which they had not had since 586 B.C., which at that point was about 2,400 years, 1917. And when the Balfour Declaration was drawn, this was the territory that was given to the Jewish people for the homeland. You see it there, in the purple. And now then see this, look what happened. Uh, the, uh, you look at the next map, and you see the yellow piece, that's it right there. That's the part that Great Britain gave to Israel. But then the Hussein family started whining and complaining that was 1917, that was Israel. In 1922, the same family that now is King Hussein, part of the family, Hussein family that rules Jordan, started whining. And Winston Churchill took a crayon and right down the Jordan River, he drew a line at the Jordan River. And that which was east of the Jordan became Israel and that which was west became eventually was recognized as Jordan. And so, <laughs> that's, that's the way that looks. Uh, and the, so, the, the British Parliament decided to give the most of the land that was given to the Jews in 1917 as part of the Bel, 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 Belfar Declaration, and they reneged on that declaration. And so, this is the reality where Israel is today. The next slide. And you'll see that's all they have. You see all this area? That's what God says, minimum, maybe even more. But this is what they have. And they want that too. They want them off of the land. They call this uh, area in the orange well, go to the, let's see, this, this is Transjordan right here, they call this. It's the other side of the Jordan River, the east side of the Jordan River that he gave to the, um, to the Hussein family. And, and since 1946, it's been called Jordan. And Jordan's king is King Abdullah, born in Amman, Jordan in 1962. His full name is King Abdullah II bin al Hussein. Same Hussein family that petitioned Great Britain to get the land that is now Jordan. So this is the map. You can see the same family got most of the land from that declaration of 1922, the Balfour Declaration. So Israel has a part of the land. Go to the next slide. And uh, this is what it looks like today. And you can see where Jordan is. That was all, a lot of that, all that was given, that was intended right here for, um, for Israel. But they got this. Been there several times. It's sad what's going on. 
So here's what you may not know. Hamas has attacked Israel four times since 2008. In 08, 09, a two-year war, Hamas attacked Israel. Again, in 2012, the Hamas attacked Israel. Another one in 2014, and now this year, October 7. And Hamas, they always attack innocent people, innocent citizens, and they, they always take hostages of innocent people. And uh, the, the, the Hamas and other jihad terrorists are all straight from Satan. And I've already mentioned how much Satan hates God and hates Israel, hates God's people, hates Christians. And uh, so, have you ever asked yourself why people turn on truth of the holy word, you know, like this book says something and the devil somehow gets them to believe something that's so messed up and then we become the bad mean people because we believe what the Bible has to say about life, about marriage, about everything. It's all Satan, guys. The spirit of anti-Semitism is definitely the devil. It's a spiritual thing. And uh, his covenant by way of Jesus is offered to all people, Arabs, Jews, Chinese, Japanese, Hispanics, Africans, Europeans, Americans, and every other group of people. And it's a spiritual war. We are not work against flesh and blood. We're against principalities and powers and demons, darkness, wickedness. It's all Satan and his, his, his minions. And listen, Halloween is definitely a satanic holiday. And um, the, Satan's, Satan is moving in, among those that are uh, part of the Satan church, among witches and other things. And as a church, we don't believe Satan has any authority here. And we're not going to hide one day a week. We're going to come out with the light of Jesus, and we're going to declare, Satan, you know, have no authority here. We are the people of God. And on your day, on your night with people going out trick-or-treating, we're going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So. But the Bible gives us the end of it all. God's going to destroy the enemies of God. God intended 300,000 square miles for Israel today. They live in 8,000, 8,130 square miles, smaller than the state of New Jersey. And not all of that's there. It's because Gaza Strip is there. Israel giving up land for peace is not going to work. Number one, it hasn't worked ever in their history. And number two, it's not going to work because it's not what God has and what God's plan is or God's will is. And so right now they only have a small slice of God's will and plan for them to have. And I'm just giving you a biblical perspective of all this. God says, it's my land on loan to my people in Israel and anyone else can live there. Palestinians can live there. Arabs can live there. Anyone can live there. But anyone who tries to take it will face my fury. So first I want to see that God denounces the nations that overtake the land of Israel. And secondly, I want to see that God defends Israel for his own namesake. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 28. Therefore, give the people, give the people of Israel this message from Sovereign Lord. I am bringing you back, but not because you deserve it. I'm doing it to protect my holy name on which you brought shame while you were scattered among the nations. I will show how holy my great name is, the name of which brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through your, before your very eyes as a Sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, for I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away. You'll no longer worship idols, and I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey the regulations. That last part is happening as many Jews are coming to Jesus today, according to Dr. Nunley many fast, fast, fast number of Jews coming to Jesus, but he, the, the Jews are going to turn to the Lord in the last days. This is part of the miracle that will take place. And you 
will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. Another version says he is blessing Israel and bringing them back to their land for his own sake. Why? Because the Israelites shamed God with sin and idolatry. They profane God just like the foreign neighbors, but they, that God's name will be great. He will show his great mercy. God does it on a personal level and a national level for his chosen. It's what he does. He goes after us to restore us. He runs after us to bring us back to himself. He is a forgiving God and a faithful God. And I thank God for that. Aren't you thankful that he didn't punish us according to our own iniquities? And listen, this prophecy says he will give them a tender, responsive heart and put his spirit in them. And it's beginning to happen. And uh, I, I, I believe that we're going to see this happen right before our eyes. So first, God denounces the nations that overtake the land of Israel. Second, God def defends Israel for his own namesake, not for their sake, for his namesake. And third, God declares himself through the reestablishment of Israel, the miracle reestablishment. In 36, of Ezekiel starting in verse 34, it says, The fields that used to lie empty and desolate in plain view of everyone will again be farmed. And when I bring you back, people will say, this former wasteland is now like the Garden of Eden. The abandoned and ruined cities now have strong walls and are filled with people. Then the surrounding nations that survive will know that I am the Lord. And I have built the ruins and replanted the wasteland. For I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do what I say. That in 2,500 years from the time the first temple was destroyed and Babylon, the Babylonians conquered Israel in 586 B.C., since then this land has gone to a waste, barren land with nothing on it, not even hardly cactus growing. It was barren and desolate. Mark Twain visited the land in 1867 and he wrote about Israel, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse of desolation is here that not even an imagination can grace, grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route there was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, the fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country, Mark Twain says, and I quote. Since God brought the Jews back to Israel and established them as a nation, God has blessed Israel and its land has blossomed. They have bloomed and has become one of the most prosperous nations in the world. And God has fulfilled the prophecy here in Ezekiel 36, Israel has bloomed. Isaiah 27, 6 says this, The time is coming when Jacob's descendants will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill the whole earth with fruit. Israel is the number one exporter of fruit to Europe. Did you know that today? Its fields, they, they, they invented the drip irrigation. Its fields are ripe all over with small amounts of water, ripe with vegetation. And they, they export $1.3 billion of produce a year. No other explanation other than this prophecy I just read is true and is part of the hand of Almighty God. God who told us to pray for the peace of Israel. The God who told us to bless Israel. Finally, God demonstrates his power and faithfulness to the reestablishment of Israel. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living again, living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on, your, on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me and suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves in complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. The skin formed to cover the bodies and they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood upon their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, We have become old, dry bones, and all hope is, all hope is gone. Our nation is finished. 
Therefore prophesy out of them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will bring, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And when this happens, oh my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I've done what I've said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. He is saying the Jews are scattered all over. How could it ever be that Israel become a nation again? But he's saying, let me tell you something. He's saying it's going to happen. Like dead bones, I'm going to move upon it and I'm going to make it happen. And God showed Ezekiel something in the future. It happened in May 19 of 48, what I just read. In spite of the fact that empire after empire has tried to wipe out the Jewish people, God stirred in the people of God and the Zionist movement was birthed with the idea to go back to the homeland and people began to return. They no longer had a common language. And it was God stirring in the hearts of Jews all around the world to go to the land of Israel, the land of God to begin to work and begin to work on the heart of Eliezer ben Yehuda, that Israel needs to speak one common language to have common unity. And listen, this is even prophesied. The fact that the Israelites speak Hebrew is a miracle that's prophesied in the word. In Zephaniah 3, 9, he says, Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. And now Israel speaks Hebrew. 1947, the UN announced a partition resolution allowing the Jewish nation a permanent homeland. Another Zionist Jew from Poland named David Ben-Gurion announced Israel independence on May 14, 1948. And you know what happened? When he announced their independence, every neighboring nation launched an attack against Israel, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Arabia uh, Yemen, Lebanon, all attacked Israel. The intentions were declared by Assam Pasha, Secretary General of the Arab League. And he said, it will be a war of annihilation. It will be a momentous massacre in history that will be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. In other words, Israel will be totally wiped out. Out. The Jews were supported with the words of the United States, but not the military might. President Truman, within seven minutes, declared that they were on the side of Israel. And we didn't provide weapons or soldiers, and nobody else did. Israel was alone. They smuggled weapons from Czechoslovakia. They had no cannons when they were attacked or tanks. They had nine out-of-date fighter jets. They only had 19,000 soldiers ready for war. And against all the nations surrounding them, just like the scriptures we read, and against all odds with these ragtag soldiers in 1948, they emerged a people and a nation victorious as a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and 37. And I'm here to tell you that God is faithful to all of his promises, yea and amen, and that God does the impossible and the end times will be fulfilled just as this end time was. It may seem impossible to us as Israel becoming a nation, but God is in the middle of it and he's saying, I am sovereign, I'm in control. You don't need to worry. All my hope is in Jesus, amen. All my hope. And what God, what God did for the nation of Israel is only the beginning of what God will do for Israel and all who call on the name of Jesus as Savior. I don't understand it all, but mark it down. When nations come against Israel in the Valley of Armageddon, Jesus is going to come and destroy them with the brightness of his coming, with his light, and the enemies of God will be done. The whole thing is real. Our response has to be to do what God tells us to do. In 1 John, here's what this is about. Another one, he, God is sovereign, don't be afraid. All right, this is exciting. I mean, how many of you would have liked to have been here when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Right? Listen, 1 John 3, 1 to 3, this is what we do. See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is who what we are. But we, the people who belong to this world, didn't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He really is. And all who have this eager expectation to see Jesus will keep themselves pure as He is pure. God is looking for a holy people, and the American church is an unholy, pathetic church. 
It's not just staying away from sin and not doing sin. It's becoming godly to look like Jesus, to be full of God. So many people, they just live like, well, I don't sin. I don't do this. They don't do the negative side. The, everything from zero down to negative 100. But God doesn't want us in the middle not sinning. He wants us to go to the positive 100 and look like God. Be full of God. Carry God's word. Be his messenger. And live holy and pure. And John 9, 4. John 9, 4 says, We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. People are dying and going to hell. Palestinians, Israelites, they're killing these people and they're going into eternity without Jesus. All over the world it's happening, folks. We've got to pray. We've got to be full of God and we've got to be about the Father's business. Whatever you do, don't listen this world is putting everything before God everything before the church everything before the work of God I've never seen anything like it if it just should convenient I'll just show up where is the fire that once burned bright in your holy fear of God in your heart let that fire burn one more time let it burn and listen we got to win these people to Jesus. we got to shed the light. Amen. Will you stand? This is a song. I don't know that oh, you know it, but the, they're going to sing it. And just begin to pray right now for God to make you holy and use you mightily in his kingdom as we sing this song.